Hello, everyone. This is Steve Marinucci, freelance writer for Billboard, Variety, Goldmine, and anywhere else I can put my byline, uh, welcoming you to another episode of Things We Said Today, where we discuss the Beatles past, present, and maybe to come. Um, let me first introduce my two co-hosts from the great state of Maine, former staffer on the New York Times, Alan Cosen. Hello, Alan. Hello, Steve. Hello, everyone. And the host of the uh, syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, uh, Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hi, Steve. Hi, everyone. We have a special guest with us today, Mr. Paul Rattan Jr., who works in film restoration, and he's done almost all of the Beatles films, including Yellow Submarine. If you have seen the reissue of Yellow Submarine in the theaters, it had a lot to do with this. I talked with him recently for an article in Billboard, but he he was so much involved in the the DVD and the Blu-ray in in uh, 2012. And you you were you were not involved with the 1999, or you were, uh, Paul? I was not. I was not, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, which we which we did discuss the other day, actually. The one thing I, I, the thing that I guess to start in with is that people who have the opportunity to see this in the theater, and by the time this goes online, hopefully it'll still be there. There are some things that they will see, even if they have the Blu-ray and the DVD. What will they notice in the theater that is different from the the Blu-ray and the DVD? Well, I think, number one, the resolution in uh, the DCP that's in digital cinema package is much better than um, what you're getting in in a DVD or Blu-ray. So you're going to get a lot more information, a lot more visual and audio information on the screen. The other thing is that it's on a big screen. You're not looking at it on a, a TV or on a computer, so it's it's going to give you this theatrical feel that it that it was meant to. Mm-hmm. So it's going to envelop you in the image and, and the audio, you know? And I, I should mention that Ken and I both saw the film in the theater last night, uh, on the 9th, the first night it was to be shown. And I can attest to the fact that the, the, the colors are, are absolutely gorgeous. They, they were just tremendous. And the sound in the theater that I went to, um, we were sitting, they put us all the way in the back. And the five one was beautiful. You could hear the the sound going across the theater, and and the the clarity of some of the the music was just absolutely beautiful. I mean, it was it was amazing. Ken, do you want to you want to talk about that? Well, yeah. Where I saw it was in a very small theater, and since my wife and I were amongst the last ones to get in, we actually were lucky enough to be in the front row, two seats together, and so we looked straight onto the screen, and it was. As sharp a picture as I've ever seen of Yellow Submarine, so it was really beautiful in that aspect of it. And as far as the audio is concerned, what I did notice was that I did hear more of the vocals, the lead vocals and the background vocals that were kind of pushed up higher in the mix, you know, being in the the front of the theater there. I I didn't benefit from the 5.1 as much. I didn't hear that much going on in the back of the of the theater, except when the song Yellow Submarine came on, when uh, you've got the solo there in the middle and you've got the captain, captain and all that. You could hear that in the back of the, of the theater. Mm-hmm. So that was pretty cool. But mm-hmm. I didn't get the full effect of the 5.1, probably if I was more in the middle of the theater or, or in the back like you. I don't know. But the sound was really nice. But most of all, I was so impressed with how sharp the picture was. Right. Right, yeah, it really was. Paul, what was some of the stuff that that you guys, I mean, you went through that thing and you did some digital, you know, frame by frame restoration. What did you, what was that process like? It was time consuming. <laughs> <laughs> because we had to go through um I worked with other artists as well and directed them. I had to go through, we had to go through and we had to disconcern what was meant to be there or even not meant to be there. We're just going to say what what were anomalies that were added on, whether it be in the uh, photochemical uh, production of dissolves and fades or in subsequent photochemical reproductions, as opposed to what was originally done in the artwork. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we had to, we had to watch it 
the frame by frame was removing dirt, scratches, and anomalies that shouldn't be there. But the problem with automated software is that when it did it automatically, it would take out stuff like very small line work and uh, brush strokes, it would take it out because it would the uh, automated systems would identify it as a defect. Right. So, so the challenge was to identify those defects and retain the original artwork, and that would include even mistakes, perhaps errant little brush strokes or, or maybe some errors in the cells. You know, because they use multiple cells when they create uh, animation in those days, and uh, sometimes there might be a little smudge of paint, or or just a little anomaly between the the cells. And I wanted to retain that as well. I wanted to retain as much of the original artwork as I possibly could. Now there there could have been mistakes in the original artwork, but that was the original artwork, so I wanted to keep that. Right. Who who. How did how did that whole process get set up? I mean, was that something that the the Beatles? Uh, I mean, did the Beatles have any direct was, input on in, how that was set up, or did they give that charge to you guys and they say, you know, here, do what you think is best? How did that How did that go? They gave that to me. Um, basically, I, I told them what my plan was for it, and they they gave me the okay to to supervise and and do the work. But I also was in constant contact, showing them material, um, and they had uh, people in in England that were looking at the material as well, that would give me an approval if it was okay, or if or ask me questions, why did you do this or why did you do that? One of the questions was the color. Um, I wanted the color to pop, and in the original 1968, the colors were vibrant. And I had to talk to some of the uh, animators that were still alive at the time. And I also worked with Bob Balser, and, and we all agreed that the pop colors were really beneficial for the, the picture and that they wished they had a, could have done that at the time uh, that it was made. Mm-hmm. We're going to switch off here and uh, so everybody can ask questions. Alan, I'm going to let you go next. I guess I'm confused about the timeline of all the various cleaning up jobs done on Yellow Submarine, starting with the 99 one. I mean, in 99, they also talked about it being done frame by frame. And, and I remember that being pretty spectacular at the time. And also Peter Cobb and mixed it for 5.1 then. And then there was the 2012 version that came out on DVD and Blu-ray, and then there's this version. So could could you just sort of walk me through what was done when? Well, yeah, in the 90s, that version was early, early digital, um, and it was a low-resolution version Mm -hmm. um, that was probably lower than high def. um, And... I threw all that material. I didn't throw it away, but I marked it no good. Nothing was thrown away. I couldn't use it. And and I found that compared to, to today's standards, it was substandard. It was good at the time. Also, the restoration was completed in 2012. What you're seeing is, is what I finished in 2012. Mm-hmm. I did continue to work on the project till 2014, but that was making materials, uh, different digital and photochemical materials that would preserve the film f- for hundreds of years. Right. That's the other part of you do. You, you've done that with lots of films, including, I believe, Hard Day's Night and Help, right? And Magical Mystery Tour. And Magical Mystery Tour. So oh. after 2014, was there anything specifically new done for this current release, or was the technology in 2014 up to a, an acceptable level? Yeah, and the, the technology today, um, as far as theatrical presentations and uh, digital, um, uh, let's just say digital preservation, is, is up to date. And I did the best that I possibly could in 2012 and that would be the best that i possibly could with the technology today that was the 4k correct paul correct okay and what about the soundtrack was that redone too since peter cobbin's original 5.1 mix 
Yes, Abbey Road remixed the sound in 2012. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what they put out on DVD and Blu-ray in 2012, they wouldn't benefit by putting out a new one now. Is is that basically what you're saying? Yeah, basically. And, and I'm glad that they had a theatrical presentation because that is, it, even though what the work I did was for Blu-ray and um, DVD, I had created it for a theatrical presentation. Uh-huh. Are there things that you saw in it when you when you finished your work and sat back and just watched the film? Are there things that you noticed that you didn't remember seeing when you first saw the film, you know, apart from the Hey Bulldog sequence, if you saw it first in America? Were there things that just seemed to tell you something else about what was going on than you remember originally? Well, I think you need to clarify the question. When I first saw it, when, when was that? In 1968 or 1998 or uh, on TV? Hmm. Well, when did you, did uh, you see it in 68 when it came out? I can't remember. I was uh, 12 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I, probably, I was a fetal freak when I was 12 years old, and I'm sure I saw it. Definitely. <laughs> Um, okay. But I think, you know, after after 50, after 50 years, I think I've changed. Mm-hmm. And especially with my, uh, you know, my becoming, well, I'd like to say an adult, but that may not be the case, <laughs> um, becoming older and also seeing a lot more in the film than I've ever seen. And then obviously running it a hundred times, um, it had a, it had a huge impact on me when I restored it, much more than, than it ever had. Mm-hmm. Um, and not, not about the songs or about the cartoon, but about really about the basic content and uh, the thought that was put into the production as far as how it related to the Beatles, basically, and, and the individuals. Like, like how it portrayed Paul McCartney, for instance. Mm-hmm. That's the way he is. If you think about it, with him getting the flowers and mm-hmm. he's yeah he likes that stuff and and George has his cars you know that's how it started out with George he's driving all these cars and and he's involved with the uh, the Hindu religion and uh, they did a lot of research on that and that really affected me to see after to see how much reality there is in that even though that the Beatles weren't involved in in kind of the way that they are or were, Mm -hmm. if if that answers your question. Sure. You've talked about restoring the cartoon section of it by, you know, going frame by frame, looking at the original art, bringing out the colors. Were were there any challenges that the short live sequence at the end presented? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. The short live sequence, the tail end of that film, the original was ripped apart. There were missing frames, there were missing title sequences, you know, because it goes through all the titles from different languages. Mm -hmm. And the Beatles section was was faded. I had to fix that. But the challenge was is to recreate that. I had to recreate that that end piece, uh, the end end title, the All Together Now. How did you do that exactly? Well, we we recreated some of the titles that we could put back together, and we cleaned them up, and we made them match exactly. Um, and the live action stuff, we actually, it's still a little, if you notice that it's still because of the colors that the Beatles are wearing on. And I think they had a different idea about how they were going to do that. I believe they were going to use sequences from the movie in, in a background. Uh, then they're all the Beatles are wearing Brown, which is very muted. And it was just trying to bring out the Beatles from that muted background. That was something else that that, that we did. Because it is, it's all brown, except for their faces. And then they pull stuff out of their pockets, and Ringo's got a hole in his pocket. Mm-hmm. So I don't think that was ever finished, honestly. Hmm. It, what do you think uh, would the finished version would have looked like? My guess is that they would have had brilliant colors in that in that sequence. Mm-hmm. Mm. So you thought they were going to add some cartoon elements to it? Yes. 
And and I believe they ran out, I believe, um, and this is what I've heard working on it, is that they ran out of time. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Were there any notes to the effect that suggested what they might have done? No, it was just word of mouth, basically from Bob Balzer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I worked extensively with him. Uh, I don't know if you guys have talked to him. He's passed on now. Um, nice. But he was one of the head. He worked with Al Brodex. Did you ever uh, no, talk I, to Heinz Edelman? Uh, no, not not in person. Um, but we communicated through Apple. Mm-hmm. So on to Ken. Okay, so when you started working on Yellow Submarine, this is, you said this was in 2012, was it? Uh, that's when I finished the the presentation version. Okay, was there talk? So I started then? it started in two thousand in two thousand ten, actually. Okay. Were they, was there talk back then of possibly showing this in theaters for the 50th anniversary? Were they thinking that far ahead? No. They weren't even thinking of a Blu-ray or a DVD in 2010. Um, it had been out of print. The MGM so-called restoration had been out of print. They sent. I had been working on um, a Magical Mystery Tour, and they asked me if I could inspect... They just wanted to look at, because they had bought all the materials from MGM at the time, they bought the rights, and they wanted me to inspect the materials, and they sent me the original negative first. Mm -hmm. And I I inspected the original negative, and I I made some suggestions. I said, hey, you've got to restore this film. And at the time, they were involved in other projects, so it kind of, kind of went on it was interesting for me because i thought oh here's yellow submarine i'm only putting brand new leaders on it and, and then all of a sudden they realized that there was no it was off the market there was the, the mgm version that was out of print they were selling it at a uh you know in an auctions on ebay for a lot of money so then all of a sudden they said yeah well, you know we got to do this and um, and they did uh, and then that's when they, they pulled in all the materials that, that were available and sent them to me. Mm. So part of that two-year process is, you know, well, you need to do this. Okay, we'll do this. Well, you need to do this. Okay, we'll do this. And then, oh, we can make a Blu-ray and a DVD. And mm-hmm. that's when that's when it started. You know, my, my goal in the beginning wasn't so much to – to make a Blu-ray or a DVD, it was to preserve the photochemical original elements so that it would last for 100 to 500 years. Sure. What scenes in Yellow Submarine did you feel needed the most work as far as upgrading the picture when you're doing it frame by frame? Were there any that stood out that really needed a lot of work? Uh, mm, the Eleanor Rigby, that was tough. That, that needed some work because of the little, there's the live action stuff in that, which is animated. Mm-hmm. That needed some work. Um, also, there's a sequence in there where they show uh, people walking to a factory and the English Bulldog, and that, that was a challenge to get in there because I, I wanted to make the material look authentic to the error that that material within the material was... And it's just a little section, you know, it's like a little window. That, the, the other one was the all too much. It's all too much sequence. I really wanted that to, to just just be spectacular. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we, we worked hard. And then, and I, yeah, because that's, that's pretty wild, that, that, that end bit, you know. Mm-hmm. And then my favorite, of course, my favorite piece was Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Uh, that's my absolute favorite in the whole entire film. And um, I think I, sp- I mean, I spent a lot of time on the whole film, but I think I spent more time on that as well. Hmm. The other, I, uh, you know, I, yeah, I, you know, cause now I'm thinking about it when they, uh, what is the song? Oh, I think it's nowhere, man. Is that where they walk out onto the, the record? Where they, they walk out so. of a psychedelic think, thing I, onto a record. I think and so, yeah. That was a challenge, too, because it is, they're walk, walking onto a record album and into the grooves of a record, record album. And at the time, albums had, you know, the kids didn't know what albums were. And I wanted to make <laughs> sure that, um, that, that 
it was an album and it was clear that that was a record album. Yeah. So yeah, there, there were, no, I don't think there was any really special sections that I worked on that, that I, uh, yeah, you know, there were different sections that I wanted to get different looks out of basically. Could you talk a little bit about the, the innovations that the film brought for animation in that year? Now, I don't consider myself an expert on animation. I mean, I, I love a lot of Disney movies, and I was brought up on Bugs Bunny and some of the classics. But when I, when I watch something like the Lucy in the Sky sequence, and I see the couple that are dancing, and you've got their clothes, and they're all rushing with colors, you know, was that something that was new for its time? Absolutely. It was brand new. Um, I can't explain the thought behind it, um, but it's pretty amazing because they even go in that sequence with the Busby Berkeley type dancing and, and all through different styles of dancing and, and ballet and jazz dancing. And, mm. and as far as I'm concerned, I've never seen anything like that then, and I don't think I've seen anything like that now. You know, um, the thing about the Beatles at the time was that they 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 didn't like the idea because of the Beatles cartoons that we had in the United States. Right. And in fact, a lot of the animators were involved in those cartoons. But when they were allowed to express themselves, they came up with what we see on the screen, which is today, 50 years later, spectacular. You know, there, there's no other animation film other than perhaps that I know of other than perhaps some avant-garde stuff that, that even comes close to it with the brush strokes and the, the splashes of colors and, and, uh, you know, the, the, <laughs> the pepperland sequence where the heads are sneezing and that, that stuff is just, it's just amazing. Mm. And, and if that's an innovation, then it's an innovation. It's certainly unlike, the early animation, the Disney animation and the Warner brothers animations, which I think is spectacular and is unmatched to this day. It's, it's not like that. It's, it's an animation type all by itself. Yeah. There's so many spectacular scenes. I love the sea of holes. <laughs> Those holes go on yes, forever, that's you know, pretty, that's pretty. And then all of a sudden the blue meanie pops up and pops back down. And mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. In the interview that you did with Steve for Billboard, you said that there were changes made in replacing scenes that had been shortened. Yes, could it, you, it could was you go a length thing. It would be a few frames here or there that I put back that were, you know, removed for to shorten the version. Basically, it, it, that's not a big deal. It's just maybe six, seven frames here and there. Okay. If I can interrupt, Paul, somebody mentioned to me this morning that they saw a sequence, and I can't remember because I don't have the email in front of me, that she hadn't seen before. It had to, I can probably find what, what she was talking about. But uh, were there any sequences outside of Hey Bulldog, which Alan was saying was actually in there before, but you were telling me that that was new, correct, for, the, for this particular version? Uh, hey Bulldog was in the 1990s version. Oh, it was. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And this is very, very, very close to that version. Mm -hmm. But was there any, were um, there any sequences added for this particular version for the theater no. screenings? No. Okay. No. Okay. What you see is it. That, that's all there is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so in other words, the, no outtakes. the DVD yeah. matches what, what, what you see on the screen as far as the length of the film. Exactly, yes. I was uh, going to mention that in the end credits, I noticed uh, another guy with your name on there. There's a Paul Rattan the third. <laughs> yeah, that's my son. Yeah, what exactly did he do for the film? He basically was the assistant uh, supervisor on the mm. film. He helped me. He helped me a lot, you know. Um, you know, he would be actually physically toiling with the materials, the film photochemical materials while I would be toiling with the digital materials. So, uh, he put a lot of work into that film. Mm. He was good too. He was really good at it. Yeah. He's, he's learning from you, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, I hope so. He's in another profession now, but, um, it's, it's kind of, uh, I don't know. He spent 12 years with me. 
Okay. Smart kid. Smart kid. Smarter than I am in a lot of ways. <laughs> Steve, over to um, you. You were saying earlier that you had worked on the other films, too. Did you do the uh, restoration for the DVD of Magical Mystery Tour? Yes. you want to talk a little bit about that, how that worked out, what you had to do for that, the challenges for that? Sure. There were major, major issues with Magical Mystery Tour. Gigantic issues. Mm -hmm. It was all shot in 16 millimeter negative. Uh, It was amateur. Um, uh, I'm not familiar with the the original production uh, as far as physical with the materials, um, but it was poor. If anybody's ever seen the bootleg versions of that or remember seeing it, there's a lot of a lot of dirt, a lot of scratches. Oh yeah, it was hammered, and I got the 16 millimeter, and it was just beat up, and one of the most beat up pieces of film I've ever seen. And also in the sequences where they have uh, double exposures, montages, dissolves. Like, for instance, that at the end of uh, I Am the Walrus, where they have the people's faces come in that are talking, and, and um, you know, it's after they go into the tent. That All of that stuff was built in to the material. It was not on it. It was not physical. It was built in, and uh, that was a major problem to, to try and remove that material. The other problem I had with it, is because of the original photography exposures, and and I, I I realized that the director of photography was very good, and because it was 16 millimeter, is the grain was the size of golf balls. <laughs> it was really 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 obnoxious grain. Um, actually, it was not shot on original negative stock. It was shot on ectochrome. Mm-hmm. which is a very high high contrast element for reproduction. And um, one of the things we did with that is I made a blow-up negative photochemically using wet technology, and we had tested it, and I tested it with Apple, and we found that by taking that high contrast ectochrome and blowing it up, that it actually opened up the shadows more so that the blacks were not so solid that you couldn't see through them. And I was able to manipulate the processing with that to be able to retain detail in the faces. Unfortunately, because of the amount of dirt that was in it and scratches that was in it and also the grain, I had to eliminate some of the detail in the faces. And that's a regret that I have with the film, that if you look at some of it, some of the faces don't have a lot of detail. They look Mm -hmm. kind of plastic. And that, that's a result of trying to clean it up as best I could. And uh, when, I, when I would try and back it off, the defects would come in and it would just overpower everything, hmm. especially the grain. The, the grain was unbelievable. Is that just something that naturally like, happens with 16 millimeter film or it just wasn't preserved well? No, it, 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 it depends on the exposure of the material, the initial exposure. Um, and also it depends on the film stock they used at the time. Um, I don't think the ectochrome was a very good film stock. I'd like to say they, they should have shot it on ECO, which is the original camera negative, but that stuff faded really badly. And the beauty of the ectochrome, especially with Magical Mystery Tour, is that it didn't fade. It was The colors were still there. They were still vibrant. Hmm. So uh, that was a big plus. Hmm. Um, did you restore the bits that were on the DVD from from among the outtakes as well? No, I did not. They they didn't ask me to do that. Uh huh. Okay. So I think you can see some of those outtakes are pretty beat up. Yeah. The the yeah. funny thing about Magical Mystery Tour is that there's a, now a lot of those outtakes have sort of leaked out onto the bootleg market. I mean, like three four hours worth. And you get the impression looking at some of that stuff that if they had had the time, it could have been a much more interesting film than it was. There's there's so much interesting stuff that was just not included at all. And uh, you sort of wonder, like, like, were they just pressed for time or, you know, what the decision making process was that led to the magical mystery tour we know. Well, what I have read is that, as you probably know, is it basically was done on a lark. 
it was a lark. Uh, mm -hmm. It was Paul McCartney's idea. Mm -hmm. And they just decided to take a weekend uh, on a tour bus and um, a magical mystery tour. And uh, they created it as they went along, you know, mostly Paul. And, uh, and then as a collective, so everything was, it was not, like you would say it was scripted, but it was scripted on a daily basis. So it wasn't something that had writers and, and then rewriting and then editing and then storyboards. And, and uh, it was pretty much off the cuff. Right. And as good as the Beatles are, as John and Paul and George were in their writing skills, they weren't great filmmakers. Although, although some of the film is, is very good. I mean, I like a lot of it. A lot of the real surreal stuff, like when Ringo's aunt is eating the, having the dream, eating the spaghetti with John mm -hmm. shoveling the spaghetti. Uh -huh. <laughs> I love that. And then the cow, the the cow keeps popping up. And a lot of that, it, if you think about it, uh, particularly where where Paul is playing and, and Victor Spinetti is playing um, the military, that's all Monty Python stuff. Yeah. There's been some, in, in some of your restorations of, like, Hard Day's Night, you've cleaned up a lot of problems that were created when the original home video was made, when they tried to replace the soundtrack, for instance, with the stereo songs. Um, oh, and then, don't and, remind me. <laughs> and in doing that, you know, there were noises in the film, like the amp tipping over in Rib I Fell, but when they replaced it with the stereo that effect was gone, and you restored a lot of that stuff. Was that more work than you had expected it to be? That work at the time was done by a, a company in New York, and that was for Miramax. Miramax had bought some rights for a short release and a, and a DVD from Walter Shenson. At that time, the Beatles, they, they still don't own that film. Walter had made a deal when he made the film that he would have all the rights to the film after a certain period of time. The Beatles did not own that film. And um, so Walter, he licensed that film a lot he, to a lot of different people, a lot of different companies. So the Miramax, I think, was the version that, that I did. And I did a lot of the photo, thank God, I did a lot of the photochemical stuff. I was not involved uh, other than, believe it or not, um, I'm not an audio restoration person, but uh, they taxed me with um, finding the best audio elements that they could use for their criterion restoration, mm -hmm. the, the digital restoration that they did. Right. And uh, I think I got credited for that. You did, yeah. I went through a lot of different, oh man, I listened to some terrible stuff. <laughs> really bad. Uh, when we did the Actually, I captured the the source material for the the Miramax version from a, a print, uh, which I've said this has been this is pretty well known. When Walter he was shooting the film in England, and uh, he was talking to who oh, was it King Features, I think. No, that was uh, Yellow Submarine. It had to be United Artists, and. Um, they said that the Beatles, because while they were filming it, the Beatles did Ed Sullivan. And they said that the country was going nuts and that there was so much screaming and hollering and yelling in the Beatles concerts that no one could hear. And is there going to be a problem with Hard Day's Night, people not being able to hear? So what they did then, um, they just turned the volume up. <laughs> and... That's all they did, way into the red, and to, to make it louder. And, and what happened was, because it was photochemical and the it was optical soundtrack on the prints, is that everything was overmodulated. And so everything was clipped. It was really bad. It was like motorboating, clipping. We actually, I found a British print that didn't have that, and, and I think that was the very basis for the restoration was was. The, one British print of Hard Day's Night, because uh, all of the American stuff was, and this is from 1964, all of the American stuff was no good. Mm -hmm. And there were no mags. No one ever was able to find out what happened to the mag tracks, the original mags, because that would have been the best element to go from. Sure. Did your restoration originally get shown on AMC? Yes, it did. 
Mm -hmm. I remember when that came out, everyone was, um, you know, really sort of astonished at the improvement and, and also the, the fact that so many things you had fixed that had been wrong on the original, I guess, home video release. So uh, you became sort of a, a, a hero among Beatles film fans uh, at, at that point. Yeah, um, I'm a Beatle freak. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I, even then, you know, when we did the AMC, that was a lot of that AMC paid for. Um, they, they aren't the AMC today that they, they were then. Right. Well, that was before the Miramax, and they paid for the video transfer. There was no digital scanning then. There was no 4K scanning. In fact, I think the MC version was a normal NTSC standard scan. There was no high def. It was that long ago. But that's because I was able to work with Walter. I worked on that film for six years. Mm. And it wasn't because it took that long. It was because uh, I love Walter. Don't get me wrong. Walter and I were good friends. I miss him terribly. He was a wonderful man, but he didn't want to spend any money <laughs> on the on the film. And and I actually was working for another company when I did the AMC versions. And that that's another story. Getting it on AMC, I was involved with a scheduling person um, through a through an industry because I'm in a not in I'm in a archivist industry through a, an association in that industry we were talking about uh, the soundies and uh, from the 40s and I said you know they have clips in these Beatles films and they said uh, she said oh yeah that's right and she, so she talked to the people at AMC and they said well why don't we use that to headline our film festival the whole shows and I was thrilled <laughs> so it gave me more money, but I, I worked every time Walter would like, well, I, I got to get a print for Berlin or, or I got to get a print for Australia. They won't accept what I've got. It was trash. Believe me. He was trying to, to give them prints so that they could transfer that were done in 1964. <laughs> so by that time they were, you know, they were 30 years old and beat mm-hmm. up and, and, and then I got the original negative from Walter. There were two, reels missing and they're today they're still missing which was a real one in ten and uh they'll never be recovered because in walter would just send he didn't know you know he didn't understand um but he would send people would want to use pieces of the film and he would send out the original negative and probably for the main and end titles and and whoever got it would cut the pieces out of the original negative and then uh they'd be gone forever so I actually found God. little lifts. Yeah, I actually found little lifts and little trims uh, in cans that had been returned to Walter, and I went, "Oh my God!" Because they were spliced and uh, oh, just, just little bits and pieces of the real one and ten. Real one and ten are gone. So I had to go off of a 1963 fine grain uh, to match in the the real, and that was photochemically to match in the real one and ten to the rest of the picture which was a challenge. So I worked with, because I loved him and I loved the films. I did help. Help was worse. And uh, thankfully uh, in the course of time with, with help, they found an intermediate element uh, in England that I I had a German internegative. I had to work from to replace the sections that were missing or, or ripped up. And, uh, they found a really good fine grain. I think it was Ron Fermanac that found it in England. Mm-hmm. And I was able to get a hold of that. And that was for the MC person as well. That, that really, I have to really thank Carolyn Frick, the woman that I worked with um, from AMC at the time. And, and also AMC because they really propelled that show into being restored and being preserved for all time. Mm-hmm. You know? So that leaves Let It Be. Have you done any work on that? No, I've, I've talked to Apple at length about that. I've done a lot of work with them, trying to find materials. Um, they want to do all their work in England now. Mm-hmm. Uh, they don't want to. They want to do a minimum of work in the United States. Uh, the problems that they were having with Let It Be was um, that during that period of time uh, with Alan Klein. Uh, and before, a lot of material was stolen. 
a lot of the Letopy material, the, a lot of the picture existed, but the Nagras were stolen. Uh, the original audios um, were, were stolen. And part of the, some of the work I did with them here was recovering the audio elements that had been ripped off. They were, uh, they belonged to a collector in, uh, in the United States. And uh, he was pretty unscrupulous, that guy. Um, Didn't they get most of it back, though, uh, a couple of years ago? Paul, I mean, because I remember well, they got most. They got yes, I was involved with that. They got most of it back. Okay. Um, but they had an issue with a gentleman um, where he sold them a bunch of material, all kind of stuff that you wouldn't believe what he had. Uh, I had made an answer print on help that Walter Shenson paid probably twenty thousand dollars for, and that was tough for Walter to do, and it was beautiful print. And we went, we were screening stuff that this collector had, and here comes my answer from it. And he said, well, Walter gave it to me. And I said, Walter would never give that away. Not a chance. And uh, they had a, he had an insane, beautiful print of the Beatles at Shea Stadium. So anyway, Apple bought everything, even though they owned it. They bought it, well, they didn't own the, the, the Hard Day's Night at the time. No help, they did. But... Um, when they went to collect, they only got part of it, and the guy disappeared. Hmm. And uh, so he, I, they actually went, they went all out to try and find the collector that that had ripped them off, and hopefully they got the material, all those materials from him. But there were still some missing materials. Would you say? Would you say? I mean, we've heard, heard differing stories um, on our end of whether or not they're really enthusiastic about putting Let It Be Out. I mean, from your standpoint, are they really trying to get this thing out? Well, they're really enthusiastic about getting every inch, every foot of the material on Let It Be. And they have talked about, I have talked to Jonathan Clyde, and I haven't talked to him in about two years, but... Um, you know, you, they're pushing along, and I think they're trying to. It's it's an enormous undertaking to recreate. Let it be. It was all shot in 16 millimeter. It was blown up to 35 millimeter. I think it was Technoscope, which is a two perf obsolete format. It wasn't very good. It was all shot on Eastman 16 millimeter Eastman Color Original, and uh, there's a lot more footage than than what you saw in the theater. Mm -hmm. um, so creating a version, and I can't say it, if it's the original version because I don't think they want to do that because it's with all the different panels and stuff. Uh, I'm not sure. I just think the undertaking is uh, monumental um, to, to, to come up with a version of that that, that would be uh, indicative of the original version and yet uh, more palatable to an audience. Are they trying to correct history? No, not at all. They just want to make a better a better product. Okay. The the technology today does not warrant so much the technology that they use uh, to do the the original because um, they didn't show the sixteen millimeter. They showed a, a duplicate from the sixteen and. Uh, it just is not, in, they, they're going to have to figure out a way to present that in a way that um, that can work with modern technology. Okay. I, I wanted to, uh, to ask a little bit more about help, but I think you pretty much went through help. I mean, there wasn't any, there wasn't anything about the restoration there that, I mean, that was pretty uh, standard. I mean, there wasn't, it wasn't, you, there wasn't all the hassles with a hard day's night and with, you know, with Magical Mystery Tour, correct? As far as help goes? No, there were. There there were because um, so much of help was missing. There was All the original negative was intact. Um, there were a lot of bad sections in the original negative, really terrible, terrible pieces. Mm -hmm. It had been hammered. It, it, it had been just beat up. Uh, not, not like Magical Mystery Tour, but... Um, and then I, I didn't have anything to replace those... Uh, sequences that were missing frames and stuff. I didn't have anything until the, this uh, interpositive was discovered four years later. So um, help 
health was a huge struggle too. It was, it was, I would say because I was able to pretty much get the materials for Hard Day's Night right away, um, and the help, there was stuff that was missing, um, that, that eventually turned up. So it was not a straightforward, I wish it was, but it was not a straightforward process. There, I did several versions of it actually improving each time what I could. And the version that's out now, I'm not sure if they've done a 4k transfer on that yet. I don't know because what I did at the last time I worked on it was a high def version. Did you didn't do the you didn't do the Blu-ray or you did? I did. Yeah, okay. I did. Yeah, I thought it looked great. I thought it helped look fantastic. Yeah. It looked really good. I would agree. Another okay. film I I just worked when I, when I got a chance to work on the Beatle films I uh, I go all out on all the films I work on, but the Beatle films were special. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. It's no, you did. You did. You, you've done fantastic work, and and I. Um, I think everybody listening, you know, sends their deepest thank yous for what you've done. I mean, you've done some great work. The Yellow Submarine film looked looked awesome. I mean, they all look awesome, but Yellow Submarine looked good. And as, your comments about Magical Mystery Tour were interesting because we've had some very interesting discussions among us about Magical Mystery Tour. But the the picture quality, you know, there was a definite improvement uh, there, and it really, you know, it really need. I I have seen the some of the bootleg versions were just horrible. I mean, absolutely. I remember, horrible. I remember. I remember seeing it back in a theater. I I don't remember what year in the seventies, I believe, and it was in black and white. I mean, that's that's how bad <laughs> we had to deal with it. I mean, you know, for a while, American audiences didn't have anything. You know, it was really, it was really pretty bad. Um, well, and that's the, interesting that it, that it was in black and white because you know that when they they ran it in England on Boxing Day, it was in black and white. Right. right. Which I never, I never understood why they did that in 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 England. Uh, that didn't make any sense. I mean, why didn't they run it? it made no sense. Yeah. Are you doing anything else for them uh, that we don't know about? <laughs> not, not, not right now. No. Um, okay. I'd like to work on Let It Be. Well, I'll let, crossing my fingers that you get that uh, that that gets done and finished, it, it would be. I mean, everybody just wants that so badly. Knowing yeah, those guys, person. knowing the, knowing how they market their materials, they'll, they'll do it. Okay. They will definitely do. Let it be. They're not going to let that slide by the wayside. I, I, I'll guarantee you that. Ooh, that's um, a very that's a that's probably a more hopeful note than I've than I've ever heard before. Um, I, you have to look at it from, in my idea, about a marketing standpoint from Apple. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Apple is no longer run by the Beatles. It's run by, well, I mean, Jonathan is a different different animal, but basically it's, it's a marketing deal, you know. Mm-hmm. It's a company. It's a company that's there. It's a for-profit company, and if they have, if they have materials they can make money on, they will. Okay. Which right. I think you can. I think I can guarantee you. You'll see. Let it be sometime in the future. It might be. You might want to look forward to it or look, look towards 2020 to see it. Fifty 50th anniversary. Yes. Okay. I think well, that's really possible. We'll. We will. We will. We will see. I'd actually like to see it before then. No, I've been saying they've been doing a lot of 50th anniversary stuff. Right. Between Sgt. Pepper and now this and. The White Album, right. the end of the year. So if they're continuing along those lines, you'd have to think Abbey Road next year and let it be the following year. So right, right, yeah. Well, I just hope <laughs> I just hope some of us are still around at that point. That's all. But, I intend to be. Okay. Well, I hope I, I sure as hell hope I am too. <laughs> and, By the and, way, and, I'm still working and I'm not retired. So just so you know, oh, a lot good. of people think I'm retired and I'm I can't because I I like to work too much. Sure. Well, great. Well, we certainly hope that if Let It Be does come out, that you get to work on it. Me too. That would be really <laughs> a challenge, especially in this era. That would really be a challenge. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Digital is not always easier, especially when you're dealing with um, incompleted formats from, uh, you know, 1969. Just, mm-hmm. it's it's a different animal than the photochemical work, so which makes it more of a challenge. Mm-hmm. And we benefited. We benefited with the digital on Yellow Submarine. Okay. Although the, I do have a. There is a photochemical version, and it's pretty. It, it's not digital, and it's really good. Uh, visually, it's really good. 
um, because it looks it's film. Thank you, thank you very much for taking the time and spending it with us and and giving us your your uh, thoughts on on all the restoration work. Paul, thanks so much for being with us. You're welcome. Anytime. And before we sign off into the moonlight, we will quickly give you our contact information. Ken, we'll start with you. Uh, You can email me at everylittlething at att.net. And be sure to check out my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. As I mentioned in almost every show, I do have weekly Beatles trivia. And you can win one of nine great prizes. And I should mention that since we just spoke to Paul Rattan Jr. talking about Yellow Submarine, this week it's a Yellow Submarine trivia question. So check it out at kenmichaelsradio.com. Okay. Uh, Alan, uh, how can people get a hold of you? The easiest way to get to me is through Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. You can get a hold of me at my email is beatlesexaminer at gmail.com. I have a Beatles group on Facebook called Beatles News and Information. And you can get a hold of the show by writing Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. We have a Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Facebook page. And there's also a Things We Said Today page for the Fab4Radio.com rebroadcasts on Saturdays and Sundays. And thank you, Matt, of Fab4 Radio for, for doing that. And you can also catch us on, you can download us on Podbean and where podcasts are available. And you can also stream us on YouTube. Just search for things we said today, radio show. That's about it for this week, gang. Been a lot of fun. And uh, that, that interview with Paul was wonderful. It was fantastic. Anyway, for Ken Michaels and Alan Cozen, this is Steve Marinucci saying... Thanks for listening to Things We Said Today. Come back and see us next time. Mm-hmm.